Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the introduction to Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial. I'm Tom Leatherman, the superintendent of the site and joining me is Tori Starling. And we're gonna start by showing you our introductory film. It's a little over 10 minutes. So let's go ahead and get started. And then afterwards, we'll share with you a little bit about the site and some of the work that's going on there. In our lives, there are moments, events, usually lasting a very short time, that result in irreversible change. As a people, we have a need to memorialize these events so that future generations will know and remember. July 17, 1944, at 10.17 p.m., a peaceful, quiet California summer night, thousands of miles from the fighting of World War II, an event took place. In one explosive moment, 320 men vanished. And in the rubble, the way the military and America treated its citizens began to change. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America, Most of the black sailors stationed at Port Chicago had enlisted hoping to fight the enemy. Unable to serve on the front lines, they found themselves doing dangerous manual labor. Munitions manufactured around the country would arrive at Port Chicago daily by train. As a transit site, not a storage site, the cargo had to be unloaded as rapidly as possible. It was the job of the black enlisted sailors to manually transfer the munitions from the rail cars to large cargo ships. With war raging in the Pacific, victory depended on rapid delivery of munitions, and the sailors of Port Chicago were proud of their crucial link in the delivery process. Ignoring standard safety practices, Two ships were loaded at one pier. The work proceeded 24 hours a day. All the sailors handling cargo were black. All the officers in charge were white. Competition was encouraged by the officers. Loading rates for each division were posted and incentives were awarded. Slower divisions were shamed and threatened. Officers and sailors cut corners to save time. Many people warned the fast pace of the work, the huge volume of munitions being moved, loading two ships on one pier, and the lack of proper training, proper safety procedures, would lead to disaster. Two explosions, six seconds apart, ignited the night sky with a column of fire and steel rising two miles. The first blast was fairly small. The second incinerated two ships, a pier, 16 rail cars, 320 men.
the survivors were in shock. Friends had disappeared without a trace. Next time, it would be them. On August 9th, 300 black sailors were ordered back to work loading munitions. Continued lack of training, unsafe working conditions, lack of any official explanation. Everyone believed another explosion would happen. The benefits of Navy life no longer outweighed the extreme danger of the work. Any order but that. Any order but that. After a peaceful confrontation, over 250 black sailors were arrested. The sailors were given the opportunity to put the so-called uprising behind them and return to work. About 200 reluctantly agreed, but were instead thrown in the brig. The 50 remaining black enlisted sailors who refused to load munitions were charged with mutiny. In time of war, punishable by death. On October 24, 1944, the specially convened military court found all 50 men guilty of mutiny as charged. All were sentenced 8 to 15 years in prison and dishonorable discharge from the Navy. Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial was established to honor the courage and commitment of the sailors, Marines, National Guardsmen, Merchant Marines, and civilians killed and injured in the largest homeland disaster during World War II. The memorial recognizes the critical role they and the survivors of the explosion played in the winning of the war in the Pacific. The explosion and its aftermath was a major catalyst that helped persuade the U.S. military to begin the long journey to racial justice and equality. Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial will ensure the story of these brave men is not lost into forgetfulness. Hi everyone, my name is Tori Starling. I'm the Supervisory Park Ranger at 
Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial. And um, just wanted to say a few words about our um, about our park site. We are um, a national park unit that memorializes those who lost their lives in the explosion on July 17th, 1944. But it was also the largest munitions shipping facility on the West Coast and was crucial to um, supplying weapons to the Pacific Theater during World War II. It's also a powerful and important place where we tell the story um, of the African-American men who stood up against injustice and racism. Um, their work stoppage and the following mutiny trial drew national attention and um, played an early part in the American civil rights movement. It also um, precipitated the desegregation of the military in the United States. With the help, of, and the story pretty much was forgotten for some time until um, Dr. Robert Allen um, discovered a flyer and uh, was intrigued and wanted to find out about Port Chicago and uh, wrote a wonderful book and um, started the Friends of Port Chicago, which is our uh, friends group that we partner with. And we became uh, the Park Service's 392nd park unit in 2009 and proudly continue to make sure that the story of Port Chicago will not be forgotten. Our site is one of the least visited in the national park system because of its location. Um, we're located in an active army base. And so currently all visitors are required to make a reservation and be cleared by the army to visit the site on a ranger led tour. Um, our tours begin with a 10 minute film that you just watched and a ranger presentation. And then we drive visitors in our uh, free park shuttle to the memorial and rangers provide a bit more information and allow visitors some time to reflect and explore. Um, we have future plans for our, for, our uh, for Port Chicago National, <laughs> sorry, for Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial and uh, Tom Leatherman, our superintendent, will tell you a bit about that. Thanks, Tori. Yes, yeah, so well, as you can imagine, the visitation to the site is, is challenging because of the location on the active military base. Um, but that, uh, when, the, uh, when the site was established officially in 2009, um, the legislation also uh, provided for uh, the development of a joint visitor center working with the East Bay Regional Park District, which is a local land management agency. Um, and the inward portion of what used to be the Concord Naval Weapons Station where the Port Chicago Memorial was located has now been closed and actually about 2,500 acres has been uh, transferred to the East Bay Regional Park District to develop a new uh, regional open space. And on that land, we are working with them to build uh, a visitor center which will tell the story of Port Chicago. And so we'll have a location where people will be able to come uh, and not have to worry about getting a background check or worry about advanced reservations. And we'll be able to visit a visitor center on that land. And so in the next five to 10 years, that transfer just happened in 2019. Um, and we are working with the East Bay Regional Park District on uh, on the plans for that new visitor center and, um, and how we can effectively tell the story of Port Chicago and not have to um, wait for the army to let us, you know, know that we can go out there. Um, it, I guess maybe we should be clear about the the active military base. Um, they are loading ammunition onto ships just like they did in World War II. Um, that's this is the only West Coast deep water munitions loading facility in the United States right now, and so they continue to load munition onto ships uh, right adjacent to where the memorial is, and so when there is munition loading happening because of safety reasons, we can't let people out to the memorial to see it. So we obviously have to coordinate closely with them and that uh, the new visitor center on the inland portion will be the opportunity for us to not have to worry about what's going on um, at the memorial itself. So that's just a little bit of background for us. Obviously this story is more than just remembering the people who lost their lives. There's this larger story that Tori talked about uh, with the mutiny trial um, and the park is relatively new. It was, it was the first site that was established during um, uh, Barack Obama's presidency in 2009. 
Um, and so we are still developing uh, programs. And, and as I mentioned, we're still developing um, a way for visitors to be able to see it more regularly. But uh, we'd love to um, answer any questions people have uh, related to the memorial and the, the history and the story. And I see that we already have one question. Um, and the question is about the lack of training. Um, was it, what was the reason for it? Was it um, to cut corners or was there something more? Do you wanna, you wanna take that one, Tori? You're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, the lack of training was due to several, several things. Part of it was that African-Americans were not seen as um, able to work in certain areas. Um, they were kind of thrown into the job and the folks who, the uh, Port Chicago was a fairly new shipment facility and they had not, um, they were still kind of learning the ropes themselves and figuring out how the shipping facility would work. So the officers that were in charge were not um, given training on training people to some degree. Um, okay. So the next question we have is, uh, uh, will limited access still occur to the memorial even after public visitor center is built? And the answer is yes. We will still not be able to take people out to the memorial except when the army is not involved in active operations. And that will always be the case until at such point the military decides that they no longer need to use that facility. Um, but until then, we will absolutely uh, have, to, have to coordinate closely with the army to provide access. Um, the next question, did all 50 sailors serve out their terms? Um, the answer is no. Actually, when the, when the war ended, they were released, but they, um, their convictions stand to this day. So I don't know if Tori wants to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so there, there was that, and the, President Clinton also um, did pardon one of the sailors, Freddie Meeks. Um, he was one of the, the Port Chicago 50 um, that was still uh, that was still alive, and he's the only one that was pardoned to this day. And there were two others who were alive who who refused the pardon, because a pardon is is sort of an apology, right? Um, as opposed to sort of admitting you did it, but you're they, sort of letting them off. Whereas the the other said that they didn't want to sort of admit that they had done anything wrong. So, and many of the sentences were shortened. So the next question um, was: the cause of the explosion ever found? Um, to this, uh, no. The answer is no. Um, there are several different um, possibilities of what uh, what could have caused the explosion. Um, the The Navy did do a um, an investigation to try and find out what happened, and uh, they came up with several different options of what it could be. Um, there could have been a super sensitive element that was detonated or triggered somehow. Um, could have been rough handling as um, things were being loaded. It could have been equipment failure, um, winches or, um, or other kinds of equipment. There could have been a collision um, which ex which with um, the rail cars that they were loading from and to, um, or maybe an um, they also considered the act, an act of sabotage, but concluded that that was not the case. All right. Um, the next question is, uh, did this incident spur any movements for protecting sailors? Also, I heard that there may have been, may have also sparked other movements in the community. Can you elaborate on that? Um, there was certainly training that was offered um, 
eventually um, after the explosion, um, further training. And um, the, the mutiny trial did um, spark a lot of attention throughout the country. Um, Thurgood Marshall um, came and consulted with the trial as well. And um, it, it definitely had kind of an early influence on uh, the civil rights movement. Did you want to say a little bit more, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I would say even more. I would the the the, the trial, and um, I think the injustice that was seen in the trial uh, really led to the acknowledgement of of what was going on with segregation in the military, and and led to or likely led to the uh, desegregation of the Navy. Um, and then very soon after that, the desegregation of all the military. And so, you know, the, the events at Port Chicago definitely um, were recognized in, in our country as, as something that um, was, was an injustice and as resulted in some changes in, in particular in the military. So the next question is about what happened to those who were killed in the explosion? Were their remains identifiable? Were they buried nearby or returned home? So um, there were very few um, bodies that were identified. Um, those that were, uh, uh, many of them were buried in, um, buried over, um, sorry. <laughs> Why don't you take it, Tom, sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, so there were a number of, so the, there's a lots of different answers to this question. The most of the people were not identifiable. Some that were identified were buried in the Golden Gate Cemetery in, in uh, San Bruno. And um, others were actually sent back to their families if they were identifiable. There were actually graves created at the San Bruno Cemetery uh, for the unidentifiable body parts, basically, of the people who were not identifiable. Um, but but many of those um, people were not. I mean, the were never actually found, and um, so that's that's that, unfortunately. And I think that um, there is there's been an effort. Um, if we do have an annual commemoration that happens uh, on or around the anniversary of the explosion, um, and that's on July seventeenth every year. And we, um, we did a virtual event this last year, and we are planning another event this year. We may do uh, we may do some try to do something in person, depending on what's going on with the pandemic. But we also are likely to continue to do a virtual offering. Um, and one of the things we're able to do with that is incorporate some of the stories from family members who uh, relatives died in the explosion. And so, you know, it helps make that personal connection. For people to understand, you know. The, the extent of what happened and, and the lives that had changed. You know, 300, this is the largest home front disaster during World War II, so it affected a lot of people. Um, I, yeah. I don't see any more questions right away. More than happy to... Um, answer any more if people have more questions. Just wait another second, folks. One of the challenges that we do have at the site is because it's relatively new, we don't have a lot of staff and we don't have a lot of funding, um, but we'll be working on that as the as the visitor center gets developed. We'll be bringing more staff on and we'll have more opportunities. One of the things that we have been doing uh, since the since the site was established is, is to do quite a bit of outreach. And so we've reached out to the schools um, and oft oftentimes when we go out in the Bay Area, um, people don't know anything about this story. And so part of what a lot of what we try to do is just, you know, it's awareness. It's getting people to understand that this happened and and how it affected, obviously, the lives of the people who were there. But it, it really has is a larger reaching effect as well. And as I mentioned before, the um, the trial 
um, and and the aftermath of the trial um, led to the ex executive order order desegregating the military, and um, and really changed the way we looked at um, how we treated our African American citizens uh, with relation to military service, um, and. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty significant. And, and as, as we, um, we can sort of explore this history and do a little bit more research, we find out more, uh, more things and, and we'll be able to do more of that research as we get more staff on. Well, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So I really appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, if you want to visit the Port Chicago site, uh, we're not available right now for tours because of COVID, but um, we do keep our website updated. Um, and so that's www.nps.gov slash POCH. And that provides um, a link to our, our schedule and on our availability for tours. Um, unfortunately, because we're on an active military base, you have to make advanced reservation for, for visiting the site. And so you have to send your information to get a reservation um, and um, you have to, um, uh, it has to be in advance because we have to do background. It looks like there are a few more questions that popped up. I apologize. Um, did the magazine get back into service during World War II and was it used during the Korean and Vietnam conflicts? Um, the, the, the site has been used since World War II. So I actually don't know the answer about its in service, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it did. Um, although I think at least for the short term, um, the the operations moved over to Mare Island. But um, Tori, do you know more about how soon the actual mag Naval Magazine got back into service? I don't offhand remember. Um, I can do some research and find out. Um, let's see, and then there's a question about, um, will DPAA get involved in identify, to identify remains? So there aren't any current efforts uh, to identify remains. We don't, we don't have any, um, I imagine if we found something in that area, but you know, things, I mean, people were vaporized. There, there's really not a lot of remains uh, that weren't already found and, and taken and buried at, at San Bruno. Um, and so I don't know if there will be efforts. The National Park Service is not heading any efforts to identify remains. But who knows, with time, as time goes on, um, descendants of the people who were killed may, may request for some analysis of remains to, to help identify them. And as, as technology uh, improves our, our ability to identify those remains, it, you never know what will happen. Uh, the next question is, it says, after desegregation, did those who worked at Port Chicago transfer to different jobs or was the change more visible in the fact that other ethnicities began working in munitions jobs? Do you know the answer to that, Tori? I was just um, finding the answer to the other question. Um, it seems they rebuilt the pier about a month after the explosion. Okay, so so indeed we they they restarted the loading about probably a little over a month after. And then, so I think. I to go back to the question. I think after the desegregation, it was more than just. Um, so yes is the answer to the different jobs. I think um, after desegregation, there, there wasn't a segregation of what jobs were appropriate or not appropriate. Um, but as, as we all know, with some of those changes, um, you know, there's on the paper changes and there's what actually changes. And so, you know, I think that's part of the stories that we can learn, learn about and share with the public as we do more research about what really were the effects of the desegregation and how did those changes in the military get realized? And so I think as we learn more about this history and we begin 
Uh, we, we already do have done oral history collection and we can, we'll continue to do that. And so one of the things we can learn from that is, you know, what were, what was the military like in that, in that era right after desegregation and how does that help us understand those changes? Um, and I think that'll also help us identify what, um, what were the jobs that people were allowed to do that they hadn't before. Um, and there was certainly, um, people felt that they could speak up a bit more and there were a lot of letters written to, um, to various heads of military about the conditions, the working conditions and the training as well. Um, the next question is, uh, where did the trial take place? You wanna take that one, Tori? Uh, sure, yeah. So the trial took place on uh, Treasure Island and um, that, I think that answers it. <laughs> any, any elaboration so necessary? Yeah, I don't know if everyone knows. Or Treasure Island is a uh, is in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. So it's it's if you've been to the Bay Area, the Bay, the Bay Bridge connects um, connects Oakland to San Francisco, and it crosses um, over. Um, and Treasure Island is in the middle, basically, of the bridge, and so it's out in the middle. And it and it was a it was built as a military uh, post. Well, it was it was converted to a military post. I guess it was built as a. Um, World, it was an ex world exposition site, so. There's a museum there now that um, we have a shared, had a shared exhibit with about Port Chicago. Um, so the next question is says, uh, so there were multiple magazine explosions across the Pacific during the war, like the West Lock explosion at Pearl Harbor. How did these accidents weigh on the investigation at Port Chicago? I do not know that answer. Um, I don't know if Tori has any info about that, but. I don't. That is something that we will definitely look into and research. Um, I'm so writing it down right now. Yeah, Tori's writing it down. Um, and if you'd like to email Tori, um, her email is Tori underscore Starling at nps.gov, just like the spelling you see on the screen there. Um, and she can follow up with that and see if we can get more information about that, because I don't know the answer about what other explosions, what, how they might have helped inform um, the, uh, the investigation of Chicago. Thank you for typing that up. It's in the comments at this time. Um, the next question says, do descendants of the victims participate in the yearly commemoration? And the answer is yes. So when we were doing them in person, uh, we would often have one or two different families of descendants who participated. Um, and when you say descendants of the victims, so um, there certainly were people who were descendants of the people who were killed, realizing that many of these men were young. So many of them didn't have like children. Some of them did, um, but but we do have folks who were you know relatives, sisters, brothers um, of of the folks who were killed. But we also have people who participate who were um, descendants of the people who did who weren't killed, the sur survivors, the the folks who we either part of the Port Chicago Fifty or part of some of the some of the other sailors, the other two hundred and. 80 sailors who um, who immediately said that they weren't going to go back, and then the so there there's this large group of folks who um, who were part of that story, and the, the descendants of that those folks also participate in the event. And as I mentioned, even though this last year we didn't do an in-person event, uh, we did actually reach out to some of the families um, to share some of their experiences virtually with us, um, and that was part of our commemoration event that's now available if you'd like to watch it on our website. So you can actually go and you can see it's about an hour long program. It's an, a virtual commemoration event from this last year. And if you want to see it at right near the end of that, it is a series of personal uh, remembrances of family members um, who, who um, share some of what they, uh, some of their story. Okay. Um, the 
The next question is, what types of pre-COVID public programs were available and what do you participate or anticipate in post-COVID world? I'll let you take that one. Okay. <laughs> So um, pre-COVID, we uh, did ranger guided tours um, like those that I described where uh, we would show the film and then have a, a short talk and discussion and then drive over to the memorial site um, in the park shuttle and then also uh, continue the program at, at the site at the memorial. Um, we also had done some um, visits and outreach type programs where we would go to public libraries or schools and um, talk about Port Chicago. Um, and now we are moving into doing more virtual things like our virtual commemoration. And um, we've also been doing some virtual programming with, uh, with schools as well. And I anticipate that, you know, once we are back to doing things in person again, we will open up for tours um, and, and the nature of the site being outdoors helps in that we can be pretty you know, social distance pretty well and still be able to, um, uh, once we're able to have groups, we'll be able to do tours again. All right. So the next question is, with the proximity to Kaiser Shipyards and your Rosie the Riveter site, I'm curious of any connections, for instance, any relatives that worked as a Rosie, whether in the Bay Area or elsewhere? Um, and so, indeed, there are connections. Um, and in fact, when, when the Rosie the Riveter Visitor Center is open, we show the Port Chicago film at the Visitor Center, and so you can learn about it there. But um, many of you, many people, I think, have heard of Betty Reed Soskin. Betty is um, our 99-year-old now park ranger who um, shares her personal experiences. And one of the experiences that she shares is the fact that her and her husband um, actually um, welcomed some of the folks who worked in Port Chicago to their home on the day of the explosion. And um, when they returned, uh, um, Betty shares um, in, some, in her film, if you haven't seen her film, uh, she shares her personal remembrance that she doesn't know whether the folks that, were, that visited her were killed in the explosion or not, because they, they never sort of met up with them again. But um, her her experiences working in the segregated union hall in richmond um, and also having connections to these sailors and the work that they did because as you can imagine um even though um people were all working you know whether they're working in the shipyards or working um at port chicago it was they were all segregated jobs and so the african-american sailors and the african-american workers in richmond um, often would, would spend time um, when they weren't at their jobs sort of together and and had connections through families. And so um, there are those connections. And, and as I mentioned, we continue to collect oral histories from folks at Port Chicago. Um, and um, one of the things that we hope to be able to do is, is, sh is to show more of those connections by uh, learning more stories and, share and capturing more of those stories so that we can I see some of the things that are going on because indeed they're, they're relatively close um, in proximity. And also most of um, the enlisted men came from other places in the country, um, predominantly Southern states and we're not from the Bay Area, but um, yeah, we do celebrate those connections that we, and we find out about more and more of them on the tours um, that we give as well for, to uh, local people. So someone asked a question, um, it says, my family sailed right past Port Chicago on our way to the Sacramento River Delta. Was the mothballed naval fleet across, right across the water from the magazine part of Port Chicago? And the answer is no. Um, that, I mean, obviously it's all part of the military, but um, that was not part of the munitions loading operation across the water. And in fact, the next closest facility was Mare Island. And, and that was a site that one, when the explosion happened and the sailors, I think you in the film, you, you heard that the sailors were asked to return to work and they were asked to return to work at Mare Island where they were actually uh, now um, stationed. They moved them immediately from Port Chicago 
and they were actually at Mare Island at that time. Well, it's great to see so much interest. Um, it is, I think one of the things that's nice about, um, about the site um, is that we have a lot to learn and as people get more engaged and as we're able to do more, history, uh, do more research, we can actually get more information. And the question is great because it, it spurs us to go and find some of those answers to questions that people are interested in knowing about. Um, so as another question, uh, can you tell us a little more about Roads of the River history there? Um, also, how has Betty's experience different uh, than other white roadies? Um, so the history, the Rosie the Riveter site was established uh, in 2000 uh, to tell the story of Rosie's women who joined the workforce during World War II, but also um, all the changes that were going on on the home front during World War II. And so at the visitor center in Richmond, we, we share that, those changes, right? The changes that happened, not just the changes of women joining the workforce, but all the changes that had to happen uh, to make that happen, like changes in childcare. Um, there were also major changes in healthcare. And so those, those social changes and all the effects on, on the, um, on, in, you know, not, at, not on the war front, but on the home front during World War II is all part of the larger story that we tell at Rosie the Riveter. And um, one of the things that uh, the Betty has been able to do is share her personal experience at the visitor center. And, you know, her experience was different than, than many of the white Rosies because she wasn't working um, in some of the other areas. She was working in a segregated union hall. The, 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 the African-American workers were, uh, were, were working in the shipyard, but they were still working in segregated uh, units. And so, um, and they, they weren't part of the same um, union. And so Betty worked in a union hall that served the African-American uh, workers. And so her experience was, was not the same as someone who was um, working where the white workers were working in the shipyards. Um, and I think the, the thing that we learn, or we continue to learn every day about the story at Rosie the Riveter, and I think it's in some ways um, will be the same thing we learn as we learn more about Port Chicago is that you know, everyone had their own perspective. People came from across the country to work in Richmond. People came from across the country to work at Port Chicago, and they brought those experiences from where they came from with them. And they had connections with people that they knew, or they had, or they built new connections when they got there. And so, all of that, all those stories, and all that history are part of what we can learn to make the the the, uh, the story more complete. And so when Betty shares her story, someone else in the audience might stand up and say, well, my father came and worked in the shipyard or my mother came and worked in the shipyard and we were from Oklahoma or whatever it was. And, and more of those stories come out. And I think that's one of the, the reasons that Betty's program is so, is so popular. Uh, but it's also one of the reasons why her program is so powerful is that she helps people to understand that their own personal experiences are, are something that they can learn from and, it helps to really deepen the story and help us understand a little bit more about what happened and how it affected everyone's lives. Um, and so there was a lot, there's a lot of connections between um, the telling the story of Rosie the Riveter and, and the home front and, um, and the changes, the social changes on the home front. Um, the Port Chicago story is, a, is more of a sort of a one moment in time kind of a story where we're, we're talking about this explosion and how it affected people's lives. But as we learn more about it, we learn that, you know, obviously the history before that created the segregated military, the history after that desegregated the military, those are all important parts of the story to help us understand more about how um, these events changed um, our country and how um, understanding them um, helps, helps us to understand ourselves and how we work in our society now. And so, um, so those, those are a lot of connections between the sites and um, we will continue to work to, um, to help, you know, share those stories at, at both locations. 
Um, okay, so let me see. The next question we got was, when did the Navy leave the location and pass it to the Army? Um, so I would say in the early, um, it was probably in the early 2000s that the, that the Army started taking over the, um, the, the munitions loading operation, the transportation battalion actually operated on the Navy base. So the Navy hasn't been working at the base for quite a while, probably about 20 years. But officially in 2008, it was transferred from the Navy to the Army. And so now it is officially an Army base. And when that transfer happened, they transferred only the what's called the title portion of the base to the Army. And the inland portion, which is where we will be siting our new visitor center, was um, was not needed or wanted by the army, and so it became excess. And when that happens, um, it gets it goes through a process called the base realignment and closure process, or BRAC process, and that uh, process allows for the redevelopment of that land into something else. And there's about five thousand acres of that that are or were of ex in excess to the military's needs. And as I mentioned, about 2,500 acres of that uh, is now part of a new regional park. The other 2,500 acres is actually going to be redeveloped by the city of Concord and become housing, um, shopping, sports facilities, other types of community services um, are gonna be redeveloped on that other portion. So about, about half of it is becoming open space and that's where our vis visitor center will be located and the other half of it um, is going to be redeveloped. And so um, so the Navy um, is no longer uh, involved. In, there is actually still a little bit of Navy involvement on the inland portion uh, related to some um, uh, remediation from toxic chemicals. But other than that, they're, they're no longer located in the area. Um, let's see. Let's see where we are. There's a question. 1997. What's 1997? You're muted, Tori. Um, that, that was when uh, Mako moved from Oakland to. That's when what? Mako, the military person, when the army came to the base. Okay. Looks like Tori's audio is, yeah, it sounds pretty bad. So you probably want to mute Tori, there you go. Um, all right, I don't see any other questions unless, unless someone else sees them and I don't. All right. Well, again, thank you all for joining. If you want more information about Port Chicago, you can visit our website at www.nps.gov slash POCH. Um, and again, if you wanna visit, we're hoping obviously, as everyone is, that we'll be able to allow people to come back and visit after the uh, pandemic has gotten to the point where we are allowed to do that. Um, and the best place to see about the opening is on our website. Um, and so I thank you all for joining us today and learning a little bit about more, more about Port Chicago. And um, uh, please, um, if you are interested, the next program that is happening um, will be um, happening in, uh, in about an hour. And it will be George Takei um, sharing some of his stories. So please uh, come back and spend some time with Uncle George and learn a little bit about his experience. Um, and thank you again for uh, joining us today and learn a little bit more about Port Chicago.